Okay, that's us. Um, welcome to the listening, Keith Tut. Good Thank to you. have you. Thanks. Yeah. Nice to be here. Great. At home. <laughs> 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 I spend a lot of time here, so yeah. So, so where is home? Uh, home is currently in a village near Holt uh, in North Norfolk. Quite near you, actually, just around the corner. <laughs> Pretty much neighbours. Yeah. Yeah, and it's such a wonderful kind of November, December, damp, cold, sleety night as well. To yes. Cozy. It actually sleeted today, which I was quite surprised. I mean, it's to be expected on the 4th of December, but uh, it still took me a little bit by surprise that uh, it wasn't coming down as rain, that it had decided to fall as white stuff. Yeah, we had we had proper snow for a couple Did of you? Months. Yeah. Right. Well, we're slightly slightly in the highlands here. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the highlands of Norfolk. The Norfolk Alps. Yeah, indeed. the Norfolk Alps. 100 metres above sea level. <laughs> Very high, you know. Nice. Sometimes struggle with breathing with that. <laughs> yeah. So... So what have you been up to with your uh, day, if I may ask? Oh, right. Um, today, goodness gracious. Uh, today started with some tree planting out in the planting shed that you actually built, rebuilt for us. Uh, so we were planting Holm Oaks today, which had been collected from Holcomb Hall uh, in the last few weeks. and. Um, We've so far planted 5,000 trees, acorns, and various other seeds. And we've got about another 5,000 to plant. We've collected 10,000 so far. And uh, we do it step by step, bit each day. Did uh, How many did we do today? We did 160 today, I think. Wow. And um, in amongst the, the sleet before uh, I got on to other things. I keep quite strange hours these days because i was actually part of today was between last midnight and 2 a.m um i was painting uh it's it's take it's turned out that i do most of my painting between 10 p.m and 2 a.m and i'm quite surprised by that because i don't have energy for most other things but somehow i managed to have energy for painting it's quite strange so why what do you think it's because of that it's that wonderful quiet that mm. i find it though that kind of time where everything is so quiet is it is there something about that maybe that makes it i i think i think that is true it's it is all it, i wondered the other night whether it's something to do with well i can't do anything else and there's nothing after this and this is what i'm going to keep doing until i feel i've done enough or I lose my focus a little bit um, but I'm still shocked if if someone said you know do some writing at 10 p.m. or or something like that I wouldn't be able to do it now I can only do those kind of things in the morning but painting I, I have a lot more free liberated energy just to go yeah I'll do that let's get let's get the canvas up on the wall and let's start painting it's very um, unhindered so I don't put things in the way of it, really, which is a, a lovely uh, discovery for me um, in coming back to painting over the last number of years. I guess because mm. it's, it's a much more sensual activity than writing. Writing is very heady, which kind of, yeah, I could see that, that the morning is when i i'm i feel like that too the morning is when my mind's at its brightest in a way mm. but yeah that sort of because painting such a sensual thing or at least i find it is i don't know if that's the case for you that it's oh, more, yeah. it's more of a body thing and, and yeah yeah it is a physical activity you know you use you're using your hand you're using your as you say your senses uh you don't i in the end i don't think too much actually I know the mind is still working, but actually the mind is not necessarily guiding the process that much. You know, you're looking at the colors. You've probably done a bit of thinking earlier on, but it becomes just a very 
physical activity of putting paint in the right place or or not and mixing the colors and and taking it in assessing whether it's working what it needs um, but not in a very intellectual way I, I've found as time has gone on I think uh, as we get older and I'm very very old that our uh, psychic our basic psychic energy our basic you know will, willpower if you like um, does diminish a little bit so I have less of that kind of energy to do writing and writing feels sometimes a little bit like grinding corn in a in a mill that uh, it slightly grinds away at one's mind and that one's using up one's mental cells in some particular way i'm still very drawn to do it but it, it i'm just aware as a process that it that it takes more out of me than than painting does music is somewhere in the middle i have this sort of triangle of uh, of um, three things, the, the writing, the painting, and the, the music. And uh, they're each different, but linked in an interesting way. And on very good days, I have managed to do a couple of hours of writing, a, a few hours of music, and a few hours of painting. And then I look back and I think, blimey, I don't use the word blimey in real life, but blimey. <laughs> <laughs> I've managed to do all three uh, plus plant a few trees and I think that's a good day that's a good day so is that how do you experience those three different arts well there's four things you're saying there's three but this tree thing yeah it is another thing that's going on yeah we'll get into that but do you do they kind of stimulate or draw on or access different parts of you you know in terms of body mind heart is there a different combination of those things or does it all feel quite similar how do you how do you experience the difference between those different mm. activities? well um i guess they are they are different impulses uh, and i i tend to work with my impulses I, I attempt to respond to the impulses coming through me and I was saying to uh, my partner Saffron the other night I was painting this portrait on the wall I was saying this is exactly the same for me as when I was 16 or 17 the the impulse for this was there at that time and it it hasn't really changed my relationship to it has changed but the fundamental impulse is 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 the same and and saffron plays the flute and she played when she was young and so you know we recognize these impulses that are strong and i'm attempting to be a, a good servant to that impulse and it's but they are there are three of them there is the painting impulse there is the writing impulse and there is the the writing of songs the musical impulse so they they are distinct and while they don't feel like they come from the same place um i kind of i i do understand that they're linked through my own uh psyche uh even to the extent that i realized what i was doing with portraits of people is is to is to reveal something about a person that hasn't been seen before to reveal their energy their character their being in a in a in a complex way and in a deep way and i also realized at some point that that's essentially what i'm doing through writing is revealing that same that same thing about human beings and myself included um so and and it's the same in music is is this revelation of uh of what lies underneath really of of some truth of a situation or truth of a person um yeah to to reveal that so that's a kind of overarching um impression uh, impulse rather so, so they are linked yeah so this truth that you're um revealing through the work is that something that you become aware of through the process of making 
or is that something that you are aware of and then you take that kind of knowledge or that experience of that truth and then make something with it Mm, that's a good question um truth is a bit of a slippery word because you know a lot of people lay claim to to truth and uh and people may say so how come you've got the truth and and have i got the truth the same truth as you've got the truth um so i'm not i'm not trying to turn it into a a big um a big word if you like uh what do you, you know, when when one is doing a portrait let's say this when one's doing a portrait i just want to uh demonstrate what i can read of that person um i think i have a reasonable facility for for reading people and what's going on in them and that's what i want to show through through doing a portrait and 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 i guess that's what a lot of people have wanted to do through portraiture i mean i've got a a book of Holbein as work just next to me and he was you know Henry VIII's court artist and his drawings and his paintings are just so revealing of character you just think I know this person perhaps even more than if I saw them in the flesh I know this person Mm -hmm. because he's captured something about them that is fundamental let's put it that way and we're not always being fundamental you know you can people look at photographs of of themselves and they say oh that's not me i'm not like that and and it's true in a way you know you've caught just a bit that isn't that relevant but a portrait is a combination of of different moments and times and modes of expression all brought together in one place and that's that's the challenge of it is to bring complexity into one image and i think that's true in a in a in a novel or a poem is to bring complexity together in a way that we can we can understand as a as a living we kind of receive it as a living energy rather than something that sort of dies on the page i was having a conversation with another painter you know, talking about <laughs> when certain areas of a painting they sort of just die on the canvas when they when they hit the canvas and you've got to kind of no stop bring it back to life that just died so one's always trying to keep this keep it alive keep this living energy so that one isn't particularly with a portrait one isn't looking at a and with trees which um, you can't really see it in the background but that's a portrait of a tree um so that what when you look at it you don't go oh look there's a picture of a tree or oh look there's a picture of that person you go oh look that's that person or Mm -hmm. that's that tree one is trying to capture the actual energy of it and it's the same in writing it's uh because I'm very, very interested in character, really. Uh, I guess that's that's really a strong impact. I sort of forget how how I think. Oh, surely that's what everyone's doing. But no, they're not. Uh, I'm just very interested in psychology and character and the way we reveal ourselves, the way we don't reveal ourselves, and what our potentials are, and what stops us from reaching our potentials, and what happens at the edges of those at the edge of where we are and what we could be hmm. that's 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 what interests me i think so just to to kind of get back into my question because I, hmm. I half got it there where it seems like from what i hear that you there is this kind of the truth that you're perceiving about somebody that's there initially and then maybe even something about them has attracted you in the first place to want to do the portrait Mm. Um, but then when you're doing it do you does the process itself bring out more insight into the person or reveal more of that person's true nature or energy um, that maybe you've picked up on but kind of unconsciously or in some other way and then it comes out or does it is it just a sort of struggle to express through whatever the art form is you're working on what you already know and it's kind mm-hmm. of like trying to get as close to the thing that you know yeah it's it's closer to that it's closer to yeah i know what this is about and it the challenge is can i do that can i can i show that I, i'm not saying that one doesn't get somewhere into the middle of it or three quarters of the way through and go 
ah, no, that that is that is there, and that I hadn't quite seen that, or something new comes out. But generally, I kind of know from quite early on mm. um, what it is about the person that I'm I'm wishing to portray. Uh, so the, yeah, then it's more of a a craft challenge, if you will, or a, yeah, it's a challenge in how to do that best, how to show that, how to demonstrate that. So so go back to the impulse, the initial impulse. Mm. Um, can you talk about how you actually experience that? Like how is is that showing up for you? So mm. that you know you're having that experience of the impulse to create mm. what does that feel look sound like to you okay um yes this is sort of the question so where do you get your ideas <laughs> which well, writers no writers get asked this question all the time when they go to literary conferences and so on so where do you get your I, ideas yeah i don't think that's i don't think that's what i just asked or I didn't uh, need to ask that. No, no, well, that's, that's fair, sorry. I'm, past, I'm pastiching your question slightly there. Sorry about that. Um, I, I, that's just narrowed it down to the world of thought, which I was asking you about yeah, yeah, yeah. actual whole experience of impulse and what that actually is. If you can yeah, no, that's good. That, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for broadening that back out. <laughs> um, ah, well, uh, I guess... When one's swimming in it, when one's swimming in the impulse, um, it sort of takes its own life and it's part of an ongoing process, really. Uh, now, it's such a big question, really, Tim, I think. Um, you know, I do a lot of meditation, so I get a lot of maybe initial ideas to do something. Um, um, and then during meditation i may get a lot of refining ideas about how to deal with something so i might be in the middle of a painting and in my morning meditation i'll just get a sense of oh, i know what i need to do that that those patches just need to be a little bit darker and i think it needs to be a color that's mostly purple now that sounds like a thought version but the thought comes after the impulse that's my mind saying it's sort of trying to explain to me that it's been thinking about this when actually it was a it was a sense thing that uh that what had come through senses make it make it up that's what i'm trying to get into like really what is it that you're experiencing how do you know that it's there what is oh, it oh well i work a lot with very very uh i get very basic yeses about things and i get very basic no's about things um, so for instance, um, you know, I've worked with trees for a long, long time, but the idea of painting trees didn't start coming to me until last year, at some point in the middle of last year, that I was going to paint trees and that they were going to be portraits of trees, portraits of individual trees or groups of trees. And that to me made so much sense. I can't exactly say where that impulse came originated but i you know i've looked i look at trees all the time so why not paint them uh, i don't know how that connection i mean maybe that connection could have been made a lot earlier in my life but i was more interested in painting people oh. so now um i i look at these trees not not as people but as beings if you like um who have their own individual consciousness as well as possibly a group consciousness of their of their species and so on um and that is but once i've had that idea then wow what anything is possible because i go out and i see a hundred trees and i take photos of 20 trees in a day so there's i then i started to think right i'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life and then it's a case of impulses about okay so which ones would be interesting? Which one is interesting to do next? I think often it's following a chain of things. Impulses form in chains and you can't predict the whole chain, you know? Uh, so it's good sometimes, although I want to say, right, I know what the next 20 paintings are. I kind of, 
it comes back often to I'll do the next one and that will tell me mm. about the one after the after that so because I'm going to be learning something on that one that will inform my choice about the next one and maybe while I'm painting a painting I'll I will get an impulse about what the next painting is so it sounds like your the initiatory experience is a thought that arises well it, it yes it does though it's i really i slightly cool. i slightly mistrust that because i know that that these impulses don't necessarily come from thought that they just come from intuition at a deep level and then the mind sort of manages to get hold of them and pretend that it's speaking on on, on as if it is the impulse but i don't think the mind is always the impulse i think the impulse is there and the mind steals it and pretends puts it on as a cloak and says hi i'm the impulse so what is it is it something physical then when you say intuition mm. well i'm a fairly um, of you that you're talking about the origin of it yeah i am um uh, obviously i'm a pretty fairly visual kind of person so sometimes it's a it's a visual intuition it's a it's a seeing of of an image um it's so it's really hard to pin down tim really uh but i think i think all i can say is that the more i meditate the more likely my impulses are to make themselves clear in a positive and um refined and good way you know and in a way that i can take them on board and i think if i didn't meditate i would i would have missed most of my good impulses uh so that's where they happen so i just sit there and let them appear and see how strong they are because sometimes one has to choose, one doesn't have infinite amounts of time, so one has to choose. Uh, you know, I want to write loads of books, and I want to paint lots of paintings, and I want to write lots of songs. Well, you can't necessarily do it all today, now. So somewhere inside myself, I have to work out what is the strongest impulse at this moment that wants expression and that wants completion, and to, as much as possible, follow the 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 heat of that follow the strength of that impulse through to its conclusion it's some things want to be born mm. things want to be born and uh we're here to help them be born and it's a partnership between the impulse and me and uh the more i'm connected to the impulse the more the impulse is a is a flowing constant thing rather than just a Here's a bit. Now get on and do it. It's more of a ongoing process of of little continuing impulses that take you in the right direction. And if if one can, you know, we're talking about the idea of flow, really. I think um, if one can get into that uh, that flow of impulses that carry you along, um, then that's very very it's a very satisfying feeling because it's a connected feeling. It's, it's feeling connected to what I'm meant to be doing. And then there's no question about it. There's no question about, is it, Oh, should I be doing this? It's, there's no question. It disappears. The question disappears. It's just the thing. How do you know it's what you're meant to be doing? How do you actually know it? Well, I, I would, uh, I do, um, accept the idea of what one might call inner knowingness even if it's just a temporary sensation for a, for a few hours to surrender to the impulse there is an there is an aspect of surrender to that and um the impulse kind of knows what you can do and what you're good at and wants to come through and i want it to work too and um that's very harmonious and there's no there's just no question around it I, it's hard for me to say anything else really because a lot of things we do i don't know going to 
the supermarkets or getting in the car sometimes there are questions around things it's like oh, should i be doing this is this the best thing to be doing um but but it gets beyond that and that's when that's when life is good i mean i've had i get more joy from i st you know, i would say this but uh i get more joy from painting specifically than through any activity i knew this from the age of 17 when i was at university and very unhappy on my course and i used to go to um still life classes uh where i would do painting using oil paint on paper and and drawing into that and one day when i was doing this on a thursday afternoon i got so excited with the joy of what was happening on the paper in front of me that i practically fainted mm. and I sort of had to sit down and be <laughs> not to carry it out exactly, but I was just completely overexcited by this possibility of it was what was happening on the paper, but it was then it was happening inside me. Mm. And that was the experience was what was happening in, inside me. And I, I, when I'm painting, I'm often connected to that moment. It sort of flickers back into my, into my world. And that knowing that, there is that possibility of incredible, almost ecstatic joy when it's working. It's not always working as well as that, but when it is working, it's it's a it's a really profound uh, in the moment joy. So is it? I, I'm I'm kind of asking the same question again and again because I'm trying to find out how you experience it. Is it? Are there sensations in your body? Obviously, joy, mm. an emotional association. But yeah. are you, when you know that the experience is happening, how are you knowing it's happening? Is it something you're feeling? Do you see what yeah. I mean? I'm, yeah, I'm, I will. I will get. Uh, um, I will get um, physical sensation, definitely. And I guess I, I get quite adrenalized. And excited uh, but sometimes I just I do get waves of uh, I can only equate that with a sort of uh, feeling of having experienced healing energy from people and and when I've been asking for it for myself it's similar to that it's a it's a big wave that comes down particularly over the back and uh, that's when things are very very good because it's a it's um it's a symptom of connection so what's the sensation of the wave um well it's where do you feel it uh i okay i get, <laughs> I, get I get a very particular thing <laughs> this is all right, we're getting into some interesting... Come on, I want to know what, how you actually experience it. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, you're, very, you're, quite a, you're more of a physically oriented person than I am, I believe. Uh, so, uh, um, I, I don't... <laughs> I, I, I probably take less, less notice of my physical sensation, but when these things happen... Yeah, it's a kind of warm, flowing feeling. It's like something flowing down my back, down my spine, and you know, goose, goosey type of goosey type of feeling. Goosey, goosey, goosey. But I, uh, I also, I'm sort of mixing it in with this other feeling that's related to what I'd call healing energy and being connected to healing energy, which is something that's grown over the last. 15 20 years that used to only happen in certain places uh in sort of um what one might call spiritual places like uh, the cathedral at santiago was the first place i experienced it as a as a it's like a dragging sensation that's pulling me down into the earth but it's almost painful but it's but it's not and it's almost pulling at my breathing, but it's pulling me into the earth and it's very connected. It's like something is doing it to me. And uh, I thought this was a one-off. Um, there's a place in, in the cathedral at Santiago where when all the pilgrims come on the Camino, they all 
go up the steps to the cathedral and there's a, a marble pillar in the front in what's called the portico de gloria the the the, the, the um the ante room of glory <laughs> and there's this marble column and so many people have put their hand onto this marble column that it's worn away this this form of a hand on it yeah. and uh so everyone who arrives there after a 500 mile walk across the north of spain gets to put their hand on this pillar of pillar of jesse it's called and there's this white palm in this in this marble and the first time i put my hand on it i hadn't done the walk but i was there i just felt this it's like the ground was kind of pulling me right down into it and i thought what on earth and my my breathing sort of collapsed but in a in a it's weird to describe pain as pleasurable well uh, depends what one's fancies are really but uh it was it was a connected feeling. That's the only way I can describe it. And I thought this was a sort of one-off. And it, I'd go back there and the same thing would happen. But then it started to happen in other places like in Iona Abbey and uh, in the sanctuary at Fintorn. And, and it's happened in Walsingham a lot too. But I realized uh, doing a bit more healing work that uh, when I was doing healing training uh, to, to do energy healing, spiritual healing, that this sensation was almost there at will if you like now it, it had become available that if i wanted to have that experience i could ask for that experience and and it would it would be there not in an indulgent way just in a way that this is a good place to be this is a connected place to be and then like you say or like we were saying earlier um when one is in a connected place then one can receive all sorts of things in a in a kind of download way but one is if one isn't connected then it's very hard and i really do kind of distinguish between am i in a connected state or am i not in a connected state so when i'm writing or painting or making music or doing trees the question is am i doing this in a connected state or am i doing it in a not connected state so that may mean have i prepared for it have i kind of had a little a tuning session prior to doing it have i focused on wishing to be in a connected state in order to make it more of a connected experience so i want to clarify the connected thing mm. Mm. so when you talk about this physical feeling of being pulled down to the mm. earth that sounds like a connection a physical connection but I'm getting this feeling that you're implying connection to something else. What is, what, what are you connecting to? Mm. What's, what's your feeling of, or your understanding of what you're actually connecting with? Yeah. When you say that. Yeah. Some things are quite hard to put into words and uh, words are really only indicators, I think. But I could say, well, I'm connected to my heart. Uh, I'm connected to my higher self. I'm connected to my source, uh, to you know, to universal creative energy. What, you know, any of these things would would feel okay to say. Uh, I'm connected to the bit that's connected to the whole. Is another way of saying. So it. it's not that you're connected something to the external whole. It's you're connected to the thing within you that connects you to the whole yes That's what you're saying yes it is so yes, it, I, I've, deci I've decided to locate my point of focus probably mostly in my heart uh not to the detriment of all my other parts but but that fundamentally is is where i think that connection happens most strongly and uh where it is most possible to connect to the the part that's connected to everything else yeah we so got into I, some big stuff quite quickly here tim well, what else is there <laughs> <laughs> well there's a lot of course no, <laughs> but, it, but but this is it, it's fascinating because i you know just to understand another person's experience of things is always yeah. fascinating for me yeah so it's like that's the interface between you and something greater than you in the true sense of greater as in it's 
bigger around you. Um, yeah, I believe so. But yeah. what is that? Do you, is there any sense of what that greater thing is? Are you talking about the greater as in everything else that you can know and can't know? Is it some kind of other dimension? Is it this physical dimension? What do you, you know, what do you mean by this greater thing mm. that you're connecting with? Yeah. Um, these are difficult questions. Uh, you know, I could, I, again, I could use words, um, that, that, you know, we could get hold of and say, Oh, what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, I think maybe it's different. Okay. It's okay that if there is no clear understanding of what that is, if that's the experience, I guess I'm just well, asking what your experience of that is. Yeah, I think, uh, let's put it this way. Um, I've been praying for a long time. And so I do pray to a source and I think that doing prayer and meditation makes it more likely for connection to occur at other times on a more ongoing basis. So when one is meditating or doing prayer, one is actually, as it were, doing it for one's evolution over time. Um, yeah, uh, for one's whole process, one's unfolding process, not for now, just now, but it is something that um, that is preparing the ground for later experiences. So if one meditates, let's take it rather than saying one's whole life, let's take a day at a time, as we as you asked me what I was doing in my day uh, right at the beginning. Um, that some people call that morning preparation rather than meditation. So it's changing the energy. It's, it's calling on the energy to be with me now and in the unfolding of the day's activities and for me to be as awake as possible while, which means connected really while I'm doing whatever it is I'm doing. Are you, in meditation are you asking are you in a kind of conversation some of the time i am yeah okay yeah so i sort of mix i mix meditation and prayer a bit right yeah because i was my next thing was going to be so what do you mean the difference between prayer and meditation for you because mm. prayer implies a kind of dialogue or at least a maybe not a dialogue just a one-way thing mm. and then a waiting but yeah meditation implies a kind of just noticing for me but I, that's what I'm yeah about. yeah i think uh there are so many ways to meditate and uh for people who don't meditate i think it's quite confusing that there are lots of different ideas about emptying one's mind or about uh just noticing one's thoughts or just being in one's body or just noticing one's breathing which are all you know perfectly good exercises um i think that um i've had a practice that goes back well, i've done lots of different things but i've had a practice that goes back over 40 years that has been based on doing doing specific prayers and then meditating to if you like receive the return of the energy from the prayers to to feel what that what is wanting to come back from those askings and that will help me as we as we go on but i i do get i'm i do get a lot of inspiration in meditation it's not a blank nothingness uh consciousness um sometimes it can be but it but mostly i'm i'm getting inspiration around certain things um because sometimes one's mind gets caught up in choices decisions to be made which way to go on this thing, which way to go on that thing. And the mind tends to put those things into often binary, mm. often binary decisions. So should I do A or should I do B? And the beauty I've found in meditation and putting questions into meditational spaces is one may put the question in, should I do A or should I do B? And sort of listening, sensing for, a, for an answer and asking for assistance for an answer 
and getting the answer, well, H would be good, and M and Z. And you go, whoa, whoa, I'd never seen them. I'd only seen A and B. Mm -hmm. And suddenly a whole different path opens up that makes more sense, that feels maybe easier or at least less conflicted or, yeah, I've had that so often, so often. Um, it sounds like you've you've kind of built in this from very early on then if you've been doing it for four years you've built in this mechanism whereby you can ask for guidance and you can get like really clear powerful expanded um, advice or, or guidance or or direction from something you know greater mm. than your your small self or whatever it is you call this kind of person that's doing the asking. Mm. Um, and that seems like a really powerful ally to have in life to me. I mean, I, mm. I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> years well, ago, you know? I didn't but, think of it. <laughs> well, or, or had found a way to that because that sounds like a really useful relationship because yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that, that this isn't just about creative work that that anything that's going on in life yeah. will require some help in that way um and yeah. it's something it's something that really interests me of late because i'm realizing after kind of my particular psychology has led me down a path of trying to be completely self-sufficient in all that i do and not asking for help and mm. really got to the end of a road of realizing the reason you can't get anywhere satisfying is because you're not asking for help. Mm. You're trying to do it all yourself and you just don't have the range of answers mm. to all these questions that you're meeting. Mm. So inevitably you're, you're shrinking the world to fit what you know can happen next, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of anti-life in a way. Mm. And it's taken me a long time to realize that. So it's really interesting because other people I've spoken to have been talking about this kind of asking for help. Mm -hmm. um, and it's making more and more sense. And I've even done it a little bit in the last few years, just in nature, because the land is very much the place where I connect physically. I mean, it's through the physical landscape that I feel a sense of connection to something greater. Mm. maybe is beyond the physical as well mm. um and trees as well i've got two trees uh kind of parent trees if you like um, uh, what i consider like a masculine tree there's an ash tree in a sort of little stand of trees with an older ash which is like the grandfather version as well and then opposite that in in a field like on its own in a field is an oak which feels very much like this feminine and so depending on what's going on, I might go and ask, you know, like the father figure or the mother mm. figure mm. for some help. And, and it's definitely, I mean, if nothing else, it's kind of made me feel like I'm not on my own in the mm. decision making. But I've, I've had experiences where things have kind of worked out or come up in unexpected ways or, or kind of where it feels like I have been helped, like where mm. some assistance has come. And this is all new to me. So it's interesting mm. to talk to somebody who's kind of been doing that for a while, because I do see a real value in that, you know, and I can see why people who maybe are more traditionally involved in or, or involved in traditional religions would get a lot of help from prayer. Cause I imagine prayer is a similar if not the same process where mm. you're just asking this greater than you thing mm. you know whatever you're asking yes well there's a lot gosh there's a lot there tim um yes i that has been my way to develop uh, a connection to that guidance which is i i mean i can I could say it's from my wisest self or my higher self. Uh, but I, you know, I do, I do, I do use the G word and uh, I'm, I'm 
right? <laughs> not not always in public, obviously, but uh, um, so. Uh, but I think energy is sort of uh, brought down in levels to us, if if that makes any sense. And so we're not necessarily working, you know, with with the center of the universe. We're working with the bit that's just above us, if you like. And um, yeah, I think uh, okay. So the, there's a process there that that once one has a sense that yes, things. If I ask, then I can receive help through certain kinds of impressions that come to me. Um, if I ask for clarity around a particular topic and I sit quietly, then I'll start to get some impressions and I might go, oh, that's good. I hadn't thought of that. Mm, okay. Um, so one can structure those clarifications for oneself. But the, the bigger question is, am I going to do that when it's important or am I going to do it, I was going to say religiously, <laughs> am I going to do it all the time? Uh, because... I think we, we can't underestimate the extent to which um, we sabotage ourselves. And we do this in really subtle ways. And we do it maybe by not asking for help and or by not asking, even when we know that we can ask for help and we get guidance of certain kinds, we may not ask questions around certain topics that we don't want to we don't want them. Who don't you know. have the answers? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so like there is this community of selves that we have going on, and they're all up to different things and having different yeah. forms of influence. And it it seems like there are maybe layers of them and lesser ones or or, or less developed ones, perhaps that perhaps even chronologically we have them early on and then we get other mm. ones that join in and but some of those oldest ones are still kind of often having a very strong influence on what goes on and maybe it seems to me like maybe this kind of asking for this this higher self or even something beyond the self asking for help from that is a way of just bypassing you know the the little voice or the the ego or whatever it is or the yeah you know the fearful one that's saying oh no no you can't do that you can't do that you you know that we know what we're doing this is how we do it i think that's right i think it is a way of bypassing those sub personalities which uh are can be very very strong and very i'd use the word compulsive uh very habitual and very compulsive and and uh, it it definitely is a process of Oh, Bless you. Excuse me. Gesundheit. <laughs> Just clearing a bit of COVID from my. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad we're on Zoom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so, it is. Yes. Yeah, so even though we may be kind of affected by all these thought patterns of subpersonalities, and we're down in the dirt a little bit with all that stuff that's keeping us confused, and some things are heading off in that direction, some things are heading off in that direction we can still ask for help and receive something that cuts through that. And we can, uh, in, the, in the current moment, we can do that and we may get that immediately and we may, it may take a little while. But in asking for that, if, well, there's another process, which is in asking for all these compulsive aspects for their power to be lessened, to be reduced, to be, for our awareness to overcome them, if you will. Um, to alchemize them and use mm. that energy, but redirect it into a more useful place. Exactly. Yeah, because we may have given away quite a lot of energy to, you know, fearful subpersonalities or angry subpersonalities or sad subpersonalities, and that's energy that that needs to be or ca can be recovered and brought back to be used for our sort of sole purpose, if you will, because it's being wasted just being used in compulsive ways it's it's not it's not to our growth it's not to our evolution it's not available to our evolution yeah that's interesting yeah but i um yeah it's it's uh it's interesting what you're saying about the trees and about relating to the trees i mean i've i've been I, we've talked about this before but i've been very um influenced by the fintorn community in scotland as lots of people have 
uh, which was started in 1963, but and and still exists and as a teaching foundation, and that was based on two quite distinct impulses. One of which was of a woman called Eileen Caddy receiving guidance from God to do certain things and to to grow certain vegetables in certain ways, uh, to do all sorts of things, to make decisions on on all sorts of things in a what you might call a surrendered way and uh the community was run on her guidance for a long time and you can read books of her inspirational guidance and i was i was very affected by that and went there a number of times and have done recently the other impulse there is the impulse into nature and into perceiving and working with the nature energies the energies behind nature and um i first encountered these at an exhibition of photos really where someone from the fintorn foundation was showing photos of trees and plants and so on and it was as if i wasn't being shown the plant but i was being shown the energy behind it somehow these photos had gone right through the form to the energy behind it and that was something to do with the perception of the photographer and his ability to be in connection with that energy rather than just the form. And so I'm, I'm very, um, how can I say, sympathetic to, to, that, to these uh, different ways of, of, well, they're different ways of spirituality, really. But I think they're very current. You know, I think we, get, we can get a lot from nature and we can get a lot from connecting to our intuition, guidance, higher self, spirit energy. So it's that, you know, above, below, spirit energy above and earth energy below. And um, kind of expand just to kind of give the story a bit more flesh. So in the garden at Findhorn, which was, you know, right up in Scotland where the weather's not great, the season's short. And they were, from what I understand, it was a very barren, unfertile bit of land where the things that they were growing in the way that they were growing, most kind of horticulturalists were just amazed that they were even growing some of those things there, let alone them thriving. Um, and that's what kind of makes it remarkable, you know, to the more sort of scientific um, people. And I'm sure they must have studied the soil and you know there would have been i'm sure i don't know maybe you know more about that than me but um well i think that i'm not even i'm not even sure the extent to which that was that was true it was it was more a case of go out to you know the guidance would say go out to the beach collect the seaweed chop it up put it on this bed and uh, and then allow it to to uh, rot down for a for a month and then put these things on or whatever you know whatever the instruction was that was from the guidance and then there was this other specific um, guidance from a lady called Dorothy McLean, who's only just died at the age of 100 and uh, over 100 at least. And she was having communication with the divas, the energies behind the plant forms. And um, these messages, if you like, were sometimes about how to, how to help grow these plants, and at other times about more. Um, general themes about our relationship with nature. So that was her specific, if you like, psychic ability was to tune into those, to those energies and and receive wisdom information, if you like, from them. So yeah, they did, as you say, Tim. They they grew all these different vegetables, and people came along and said, "This is impossible. How can you do this? We don't understand. What are you?" what magic are you working? <laughs> so that was the sort of myth of Fintorn. But it, at the heart of that was, was the idea of what is possible when you do what some people call co-creation rather than just, mm. I'm a human being, I'm going to create something, I'm going to express myself, which is the kind of current way of looking at it. Um, what happens when you attempt to do that in concert with with other energies with with your soul with with um soul energy with spirit energy what happens when you go on that journey to to surrender to to that and act as a as a channel for that 
uh, in, but without without turning oneself into an empty vessel because it sort of needs one's own skills you know uh mm. one of a um, friend of mine says well uh maybe if you had very good intuition and guidance you could uh from a standing start become a brain surgeon and, and your intuition would tell you what to do but really it's better if you've had the training yeah. <laughs> at least for the first 50 of your uh, <laughs> yeah so <laughs> there, there there are things that we can do to if you like prepare ourselves to be you know to be in that co-creative uh endeavor and i i love that idea of co-creation yeah. that we're in a we're in a it's it, we're in a relationship with this other spirit level energy Absolutely. and uh, this, that's what we've come to do this is something that um that really interests me because of my own journey here because i've been unwittingly i because i came to live in the woods here in norfolk about 17 years ago i think it was and over that time i've become so involved with the land in a relationship with the land and have co-created situations and places within the landscape here and it is very much that feeling of it's me and the land doing something together mm. and there's a kind of felt sense of that that I certainly have, and through conversations with other people who've been around and have, have come here, they've also expressed a version of that, at least. And so it's become something of a kind of fascination with me because I feel like it may be not just the land and the energy of the land, it may be also other energies like you're saying soul energy or spirit or something bigger i don't know but it's it's been kind of primarily or for me it's come through the land and this this sort of sense i think i've always had ever since i can remember of a kind of holiness of landscape and the beauty of nature being this kind of divine experience for me or what i understand as divinity Mm. Um, and yeah I'm kind of fascinated because I'm really just at the start of the journey and it wasn't something I set out to do or mm. it just very slowly and naturally been revealed to me and by eating from the landscape and living in it and having a very woven in experience of it and, and having seen my children grow up in it from the beginning so you know really observing a kind of as much as you can in a western modern life a kind of indigenous experience which is mm. kind of what my girls have had mm. um and if there was a whole culture living very closely with the land you know the, to hold that to give them a kind of cultural um framework as well then they would be completely indigenous you know mm. um, and so it, it's just really fascinating to me because I feel like one of the things that we're being called to do now as a, a whole kind of species is to remember, especially in the West, because in some places it's still hanging on, you know, since forever, but to remember the land and this connection and this relationship as, as a, a primary relationship to any healthy culture mm. and i feel like what's brought us to the edge of kind of self-termination is the fact that we've forgotten that we're inseparable and a part of this web of life and the landscape and only by taking ourselves away from that could we actually then harm it so much that it's become unstable as a place to live so I really feel like this healing of that relationship and a remembrance mm. um, is kind of what I'm being called to do in some way or to share that now, mm. like to say, look, I know this. I mean, I know it from having lived it. Yeah. That there is an incredible beauty and meaning and abundance of resource that the land has to offer when you're in good relationship with it. Mm. 
And I suppose my discovery has been that you connect through your body mm. and, and, and culturally we've been very much in our heads. And I feel like coming down into the heart and then into the body and then into what I call the greater body, which is the land itself, that that route back is, is a kind of a necessity now. And mm. it doesn't mean that you can't have the technology and, and the kind of, we've even left our heads and gone into <laughs> cyberspace. You know, we've got a new layer now, which is yeah. external to the body. And yeah. a lot of us, most of the time, are actually not even in our heads anymore. We're in this other place mm. even further. But there's no reason that you can't have access to all that. But I feel like a kind of reharmonizing and rebalancing and, and plugging back into the earth in a meaningful way mm. is the only way we're going to make it through whatever mm. we're kind of facing. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really, really good and really interesting. And I uh, no, I really respect what you've done there and the journey you've you've been on. And I, I hope you are able to communicate it to a lot of people because it's a very particular experience you've had and you've 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 done it really at a deep level and that's what's made it profound f for you and i think it would be great to share it and uh you know that's your gift is uh, maybe that you can that you have to give and, and not everyone it's it's off you know it's often like this not everyone's gonna want to hear that uh not it's not going to be everyone's thing and i i see that with my own work and but that's not doesn't matter we've we've all got to sing our song i think you know we've got to find our song and then we got to start singing it <laughs> yeah for sure i mean I, i'm i'm definitely feeling that now that this is that the apprenticeship has ended and now it's time to start you know mm. working it into the world in some way um, yeah so but but it, it it kind of brings up this thing of the trees which you kind mm. of started off with and but it didn't really go into what are you doing with all these seeds? What's your, <laughs> your idea there? Um, okay. Well, um, I've had a, I've had a love of trees since I was really young because I grew up uh, in a place where we had a couple of acres of woodland and my dad was really into trees and growing trees. And it was just a small amount of, of woods. And then in 1987, um, our garden was, uh, was put on the front of the newspaper, the local newspaper, from a helicopter shot because all the trees had been blown over in the October 87 storms. And this was a massive thing for my dad. And he couldn't really process it or understand whether it, this was God or the devil. I found a piece of paper where he said, who has done this? Is it God or the devil? And um, yeah, he, he, he lived another seven years after that but it it was a profound uh, loss for him to have this whole forest snapped like matchsticks um but i gr i grew up loving these trees and there were a lot of trees around the whole area so i think he he passed on his love of nature he wasn't a religious guy um his his thing was nature so i i probably didn't appreciate it fully at the time but that's what he handed on something of to me and um, I guess back in the 90s, I had a small tree nursery. I just started growing uh, oaks particularly and um, grew a few thousand then and discovered that how to do it because one has to come to an accommodation with, uh, with the mice and the other um, animals who'd like to steal the acre or not steal, just take for their food. So one has to come to an accommodation of how that's going to work. And, uh, but at the same time, keep one's own germination rates up if you like. So, um, I, I think, I, I'm sure this is true for lots of people, but you do things for a little while and then you park them and you forget about them. And then, I don't know, 10 years later you go, I think I'm going to pick that up again. And you pick it up sort of almost at exactly the same point where you left it. And then you want to see how it's going to develop from there. But more recently, um, more recently, particularly with my partner, Saffron, we're both interested in trees. So we decided 
to start growing trees. I did have a meditation once a little while back. I asked the, I was asking the question, go back to our asking, what would be the best thing that one can do for the planet for from an environmental perspective what is the single best thing that someone like me let's put it like that someone like me could do to improve conditions and the risk the response i get but and you might say so how did this response appear i can some of this stuff turns into words for me but and it's impressions and that turn into words let's put it like that so it comes as energy and it turns into words my sense was uh to plant trees but but actually it was to it was saying to secure land and to plant trees so i i, I sort of wondered oh well okay so i'm not i don't know how i'm going to be in a place to secure land but maybe i can I guess I had a thought, well, maybe I can convince people who have land mm. to plant more trees. So that, that has hovered around for a, for a year or two, that knowing that, yeah, I mean, it's pretty self-evident, really. It's nothing miraculous about that. It's just a good idea. It's one of the best things we can all do um, from a you know, planetary um, survival perspective. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'd like to turn that into something practical doable something that i really enjoy and uh i mean i also think you know i do i do see it as a as a business it's not it's not completely a charitable uh donatory act at this moment although clearly one with tree growing you spend the first few years of uh putting in your time and and um enjoyable labor to see what happens uh, so it's so it's unconditional in that sense you know i mean i'm pretty hopeful that something in the that process of germinating a seed that fascinates you as well yeah there is i, I it's i mean we we're down in the kitchen and we're we're getting all these acorns out of their their cups ready to, ready to be planted and then they get soaked in water and and i just look i take pictures of them but i i just look at them and they're so they're so beautiful and so miraculous you know how can that little that little thing how can that become a 500 year old tree that's got a girth of you know 30 feet or something and and is is 100 feet tall how can that happen i mean okay i i ask a scientist and they'll give me a perfectly good answer to that but it's still okay well you make me one you know <laughs> <laughs> you you show, you make one on in the lab and show me how you do that it's uh it's a miraculous miraculous process and when you see that acorn just split and the little root tip come out of it and you think that's life wanting to be born you know mm -hmm. it's like it's this is a bit like being a midwife to five five or ten thousand little babies mm. <laughs> it's great I know, I know that feeling i've i've I really like and trees in particular you know you're growing any plant it's wonderful to see the shoots but there's something more that I get from a tree there's something more exciting mm. from and they're very individual as all plants mm. are when they come up and how they come up and the whole process but there is something really magical and attractive about that because I also have that something of that um i grew some when before i moved to norfolk i the last place i lived in london was in bow in the east end in the most kind of urban place i've ever lived because it was right by the blackwall tunnel approach which mm. was like six lanes of traffic mm. and it was all industrial buildings around and then behind us was the river lee um and i had a sort of roof terrace there and I used to go around the parks in London collecting seeds because I had all these ideas of like an arboretum, mm. you know, growing all these exotic trees. And so I had pots of trees that I was germinating. And, you know, I had this little tiny forest in mm. my garden. And then when I moved to Norfolk, I, and, and after having found somewhere to live and um, 
come to an agreement with a landowner about using a bit of land, I actually had somewhere I could plant some of these trees, the ones that had made it. Um, and so I brought them all on the roof. I had a Land Rover at the time. I drove down the M11 with all these little trees on the roof and I put them in the ground. Um, and some of them died and, and some of them I, di I didn't plant because I'd sort of lost interest in the exotic thing because I'd fallen in love with the native trees after mm. having been here for a little while. And now at the top of the field, there's a wood. Mm. Well, 17 years later, and they're, they're big trees, they're trees, yeah. and it's yeah. a place. And it's the most rewarding thing, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Mm. You know, I walk up there and there's a whole living place that's going on. And it's so beautiful to me. Mm. And, you know, and it's, it's a bit of, I did it, but it was the land did it because there's self-sown oaks in there and ash and a bit of willow and, you know, and all the birds move in and, you know, the brambles arrive and the, the roses mm. start to grow. Mm. And, you know, and even the most exciting this year in particular was I, I even planted some apple pips. Mm. Um, just to see what would happen yeah and we've got about seven really delicious apples which potentially could be new varieties amazing and this year they've all fruited oh, and really? completely different flavors yeah so exciting i can't tell you <laughs> did, did you put those straight into the ground just as pips yeah that's amazing yeah and you know some of them are absolutely delicious yeah and so oh, I'd love to taste them. Yeah. <laughs> you will, you will. Um, so we had this wonderful thing of naming them this year, me and the kids and right. giving them names and, you know, starting to get that relationship with them. Like that, you know, like your paintings, they're, mm. pe you know, they're people. Mm. Um, and I've had that also a relationship with trees that have self sown that I found when I was clearing some of the trees around where I live to let more light in and prevent them falling on the shed in a storm. Or, um, I found there was a, one in particular, there was a birch tree just growing in amongst the pines because there were these big forestry commission Corsican pines. And I felled a whole load of those around. And I just left this birch when I was clearing all the bracken and the brambles. Um, and we used to have a little outside toilet next to it. And now it's all just grass around it and a few of the big trees. And this birch is a wonderful, mm. big, graceful birch tree on its own. And I've known it since it was a baby. And it's yeah. like, it's, it's not even like, I have a relationship with this tree and mm. I know it as an individual being. Mm. And I get such joy from that. And, and mm. last year for the first time, fly agaric appeared all around it so oh, right. it's now established you know with the soil it's for it's like for me it was like a coming a coming of age for the tree when mm. the fly agaric appeared it's like now it's a tree it's <laughs> no longer sapling yeah this is the first year yeah such a, you know and that kind of relationship with with the world with the land yeah it's so rewarding and so I have yeah. so much love for that tree. I can't, yeah. you know. Well, it's, that's amazing, Tim. I, I love that. And I, as you speak, I, I mean, I've had this sensation before with you that actually maybe once upon a time when more of us lived, you know, in, in the country and, and worked on farms and so on, uh, we would have had the opportunity for those experiences. But now you're an incredible rarity. To, to have that that life and you've made that your focus you know you've that that is your life in in the house where you are and with all the woods around and you've you've made that conscious decision to make your life about about those experiences and about those relationships uh but it's so unusual to you know it's so unlike what what appears to be modern culture though i do think a lot of us are craving connection uh, that kind of connection and that that what's interesting to me is you're describing that connection to that tree as another life form and yeah i i mean which i completely get and it's not so different 
to a connection to um, another human being. And uh, we, all of us are craving joyous connection of some kind, Uncom well, connection that isn't, that, that where love can go across the, the gap between us. And somehow, sometimes that's m more easy with, with nature forms than it is with human beings because we are pretty complicated. And, you know, it's one reason why people have dogs and cats because they appear to be relatively simpler than those difficult humans that we try and get on with. And, uh, but we're still, we can't get away from this natural craving to be in connection with other people. But, uh, and at the same time, the quality of that connection is determined by, for me, I think, uh, the quality of our connection with ourself. Mm. That's what determines the quality of our connection with, with others, with animals, with plants, is, is the quality of our connection with ourself. Mm. And so that's, for me, that's sort of where the work gets done, if you like. Yeah, that's definitely where the work needs to be done with me. Or, or maybe, you know, we talk about these different parts of ourselves. The part of myself that connects to nature is healthy and happy and strong and thriving. The part of myself that connects with people, that's the one that needs the work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm working on that, though, always working on that. But yeah. it's interesting, you know, and I do. this. Well, we're doing it now. Well, this tree is a person to me. It, mm. It's a friend of mine, for mm. sure. You know, it feels like that. And so, you know, I'm surrounded by friends and there are old friends and there are little ones that have just appeared this year. And I get so excited. It's like, oh, look, there's a new hazel tree growing. Mm. And, you know, depending on where it is or what's going on, it might not survive. It might get mown or cut or, but then it might not. And it might be like, oh, okay. I'll clear away those brambles that are kind of swamping it, that are taking the light. Mm. So give it a chance. And if it wants to grow, it will. You know, maybe it will die out because it dries out. We have a dry summer or spring. Mm. Maybe not. And then, and it's this kind of seeing the landscape growing all the time and changing and these characters appearing, you know, just like in communities. And, you know, I imagine that it kind of, I can I can really strongly imagine what it must be to be in a tribe living in the Amazon or something where you have this this strong connection with a whole group of people, but you're all completely connected with the land as well. The animals, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, whatever's around you. And it's all a community. And there are friends, there are enemies, there are difficult people, there are, you know, all these different aspects. And it's so rich and so full of meaning and so fulfilling that that's why you stay like that for thousands of years, because you don't need anything else. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's fascinating to me that, you know, clearly there was some impulse to to do something different and it was probably caused by um a trauma or or, or a, a loss of resources or a changing climate which meant you had to move somewhere and then maybe the place you moved to was a more difficult place to survive and so you had to get more creative and create we weaponry or tools or or find clever ways to make it through and maybe that's kind of what led us on to the more technological um road but i but i i really know from in my body now that if you're in a good relationship with the land around you and a reciprocal relationship everything you need is right there and all your culture rises out of the soil your music your song your poetry out mm. of relationships between things it's all kind of there um I don't know where I'm going with this, but well, I, 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 it's, it's interesting because what you're what you're doing is you're talking about it. You're talking about your experience, and I, I'm I'm sitting here wondering. So, do you wish 
it, because because one one can say all these things but it doesn't give another person an experience you know i can talk about connection or something but that doesn't give that other give another person that experience that's not what how it happens so i'm thinking so do you tim wish to directly facilitate other people having those experiences or you know or similar not the experience you've had but similar experiences of connection to plants and the land is that is that what you would like to facilitate yeah i de there's definitely something there that it's part of my also this healing of my relationship with the world and people mm. um and i've had experience because i've done things we've had you know i had a venue in the woods called the clearing for a few mm. years where people came in and did workshops and camps mm. and you know various practices and and it was incredible just to see the effect of the place on the people mm. as they arrive like people coming from london and just seeing their whole body change as they came into this space and over a weekend like landing back into themselves and the way people would connect and it didn't matter who it was you you know you would find connection with anyone mm. and all that kind of judgment and sort of reserve and spikiness that i kind of associate more with the city would just kind of peel off and fall mm. away as time progressed and you know it was also some of the activities that were going on that would enable that too and i do i i really do i i feel like i want to share it i want because mm. it's such a resource yeah and more than ever and even more than ever given what's going on with the pandemic it feels like it's so important as a kind of free resource mm. to go yeah. and find the land where you live and make a connection yeah. but also once you do that and you kind of fall in love with it like i did you you just want to protect it you want to help it mostly by withdrawing the human impact that's damaging it but just enabling it to to do what it wants to do which is just thrive because it's like that acorn it's just bursting with potential the land and mm. all it needs is the space to do it and then mm. it attracts different animals and plants and this com complex relationship feeds everything that's there mm. and so you have paradise i mean that's it so if i could you know and as i'm kind of coming out into the world again i'm thinking of ways i can create situations and and involve other people who have practices, who have skills, you know, land-based kind of healers or, mm. or, or forms of personal development or creativity even mm. that are woven into the landscape or can use the land or use that setting um, or work with that setting rather, co-create as you say, because mm. it's definitely the land itself that's bringing a massive part to the experience that the people are having there. If you were doing it in a conference center in Birmingham, mm. you just wouldn't have the same experience no. as in a clearing in the woods in Norfolk, yeah. on the sky, you know, barefoot on the grass, whatever it is, it's, it's just completely different. Well, it has to be done, Tim. And uh, let me know if you need any help. Yeah. I'd be interested to, yeah. to be part of it. Well, I am, I am going to put the call out for any healers or people who might want to work with the land. Mm. I want to set up some kind of facility for people to be able to come and do their thing independently and utilize the space, um, but maybe just kind of give a, give a sort of tithe or a little bit of what they earn if they're earning mm. towards the bigger project. You know, something oh. like that where... People can really be their own person and do their thing, but it, what it does, and this is what I've found from things we have done, is that all the things that happen here put energy into the land and, mm. and all those good experiences or those profound experiences, they soak into the land and then the land becomes more powerful as a tool for enabling healing, creativity, connection. Mm. You know, and I've, I've really felt that and yeah. seen it. You know? Yeah. 
So I, I'm, I want to find ways to make it easy for people to say yes. And, and also to create a kind of gravity that draws energy in. Mm. Um, something I need to uh, clear with the landowner, though, of course, first <laughs> before... But I, I yeah. think he's a very... Yeah, he's quite he's sympathetic, I think, isn't he? He is, he is. Well, he's already been very supportive of what has happened already. So. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like this is almost like the blossoming of the growing that I've been doing since I've been here. And it, mm. and it feels like it's time for it to expand now and, mm. and, sh and share it and bring... Yeah, it just feels like we, this is what what we what i'm being called to do anyway but it yeah it's... i can really um i can feel that you know i mean i've you know i've known you for for a little while now and uh and i can feel the sort of evolution of this idea and the sort of maturing of of the impulse within you to do to do this and uh i'm i'm very excited by what you're doing and i i would love to be to be a part of it in some way i love your place it's beautiful yeah i think it'd be nice to um have one or two well we did talk about maybe getting some of your seed like uh, almost the kind of arboretum idea like maybe saving one of each particular interesting tree and yeah if there are places within the wood or around the edges where these things absolutely might live it would be I'd be a wonderful shared experience for um, us to put in one of those little trees and then to watch it grow. Over yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. I've got a, f I've got a few for you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, exciting. <laughs> no, I look forward to that. It's going to be very exciting in March, April when they all start to uh, yeah. emerge. It's going to be the nursery. The nursery is going to be full of, screaming kids as it were you know they're all going to be uh coming out it's so exciting when they just peek their little their little shoot out of the of the uh soil and start start coming up it's very exciting those scream you say screaming kids the screaming greens those <laughs> little the brightness of a new leaf in spring, yeah the cleanness and the shine of, yeah oh that's yeah. joys after it's the break. great really great I don't know how long we've been talking for. It's time has disappeared, Tim. I, I've no idea. It says here it's we've been talking for a little while. <laughs> we have. Well, do you feel like we? That's a good place to to pause. This there can be other times as well. I, yeah, I, yeah. I kind oh. of imagine having you know revisits with people all the time because i really like to that would be great you know, especially with you i'd like to talk more thank sure. you no i'd love to talk more uh i could i could talk more um it's been a really uh it's been a really interesting conversation i i didn't i didn't know that we were going to get into things in such depth but i i should have assumed that <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because it, it wasn't known. There, I guess I'm quite relaxed about it, because I know that if you just let it happen, something interesting, the journey yeah. will be interesting. If I try and control it or steer it, I'll kill it. So the intention was just to have a good conversation and and then let it go and see yeah. what it wants to be. Yeah. Well, I feel we've covered some interesting ground and um i mean I, i'm sure i've got lots to say about all sorts of things but um i i don't there's not you know there's nothing particularly on my mind at the moment i feel no, I think maybe this is a good place to stop and um mm. and we'll do another one soon that would be great I, i'd love to do that it's been really enjoyable and um and it's felt very uh, awake, to use the word, which is exciting. Great. Thanks, well, Tom. Great. Keith Tut, thank you very much. It's been Thank nice. you. I'll see you soon. I we'll, hope. we'll speak soon, and I hope we'll get to actually see each other. Yes, for sure.
Take care, Tim. Thank you.